Chapter Twenty One of the King's Daughter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The King's Daughter by Pansy. Chapter Twenty One. Jim Forbes's Speech. I have seen his ways and will heal him. I haven't heard a word from him since he went away. Mister Nelson told Dell as they two walked down the street together toward the church. It was the evening devoted to the temperance meeting. I used all my influence with Mr. Elliot to send some other fellow and let us keep Jim here under our influence, but I accomplished nothing. Jim happened to be the best man for the sort of work that they wanted done, and of course his well-being must not be weighed for an instant against the press of work. I fear the very worst for him. He has gone to a hard place. He spoke in a troubled tone, and Dell answered him listlessly, as one weary and discouraged. He could hardly do much worse than he was doing here. He broke the pledge three times, you know. In truth, she was both weary and discouraged. She was beginning to feel that she had toiled all night and caught nothing, nothing accomplished, or at the best such trifles that they might almost pass for nothing. Six weeks had passed since that sad funeral, and she had not seen Mister Tresevant to speak with during that time. She had hoped so much from that painful time. She had imagined that her faith was strong and the way distinct. She had believed that, from the scenes of that solemn time, God meant to speak with force and power to the soul of this servant of His, and arouse him to higher views and holier purposes. During all her sojourn in the house of mourning, while mingling her tears of heartfelt sympathy with the widowed bride, there had been an undertone of solemn joy in her heart. And she watched and waited for the hour when she should hear him declare himself led by the awful power of God to look at life from a different standpoint. This hope, rather this belief, bore her during the trying funeral scene, when the pastor sat with white, suffering face, apart, and heard the voice of a stranger lead the service. Her heart bled for him. It is cruel, she said under her breath. He cannot think that I had anything to do with it. Or if he thinks so today, he will not tomorrow when some of the bitterness has passed. I would not have him endure this scene if any word of mine could have helped it. And yet underneath this feeling was that other one almost exultant. The Lord whom he serves is leading him, is showing him just where he stands, and he is good and sincere and will come into the full light. But tomorrow came and went, and Mister Tresevant went steadily on his usual work, doing nothing more, only avoiding her. Not seeming to desire even so much as a glimpse of her, clearly he believed his public disgrace was owing to her, and clearly too he thought only of the disgrace, nothing of the soul gone down to sudden darkness that his outstretched hand might have saved. It appeared in time that the disgrace was not much after all. People remarked how deathly pale Mister Tresevant was on the day of the funeral, and how well it was that he did not undertake to conduct the services, else he would surely have failed. Then they added that he must have cared more for young Elliot than they had supposed, and then they turned to something else and forgot all about it. So the minister carried in his eyes, whenever he was obliged to meet Dell, a look of proud satisfaction that her scheme to humiliate him had failed, and she knew not what to think. Everywhere her work and hopes seemed equally to have come to naught. So on this particular evening she spoke bitterly, almost indifferently, about Jim Forbes. She did not feel indifferent, only discouraged. Poor Jim had certainly been a discouraging object. He had signed the pledge and broken it so many times that she had almost lost her desire to have him sign it. Now, for six weeks, he had been away, sent by Mister Elliot to help mend broken machinery at another mill, situated in a town, if possible, lower in the social and temperance scale than Lewiston. And Dell felt as hopeless concerning him as Mister Nelson possibly could. Even though she nightly commended him to the strong arm that she firmly believed was mighty to save, and Mister Nelson never did any such thing. Tommy Truman met them at the door and came forward to them, indeed, with eager face. Jim Forbes has got back, Mister Nelson. He proclaimed when he was within speaking distance of that gentleman. Has he indeed? Answered Mister Nelson heartily, while Dell said not a word. Yes, sir, and he is coming to the meeting this evening. He says he has got something to tell the meeting. Dell looked up to Mister Nelson with a wan smile. He wants to sign the pledge again, I suppose. Poor fellow, she said, still speaking listlessly. And then they went into the church. A fair-sized audience was already gathered. It was becoming quite the fashion to attend these temperance meetings. The music and literary exercises continuing very attractive. 
Mr. Tresevant and Miss Emmeline Elliot were present. Mr. Tresevant very rarely attended the meetings during these days, but some power had drawn him thither on that particular evening. Presently came Jim Forbes down the aisle, with steady step and a clear light in his brown eyes. Also Jim wore a clean shirt, and a whole coat that had been carefully brushed. His hair was combed with unusual nicety, and his collar was firm and white. Altogether Jim had never looked so well in his life. Trooping down the aisle after him came Dell's entire class, and after them a large delegation of some of the worst characters in the mill. They took their seats noisily, with expectant faces. Evidently an unusual interest centered around Jim Forbes that evening, though he could not have been in town more than an hour. He went directly to Mr. Nelson and whispered a few words. That gentleman nodded assent, and then Jim quietly took his seat, pausing only to grasp Dell's hand for an instant as he passed the organ. At the conclusion of the literary exercises, Mr. Nelson announced that their friend Forbes, who had been absent for several weeks, had a few words to say. Jim arose at once and came forward with an air of simple dignity that was new to him and became him well, and this was the speech he made. I don't know how to make a speech. I never made one. But I've got something I want to tell you. I told the boys if they would come down here with me tonight, I would tell them something, and I wanted to tell the rest of you. You all know what I've been, and some of you know how hard I've tried lately to stop drinking. I wanted to stop. I meant to stop. When I signed that pledge, I thought I had drunk my last drop. But it wasn't so. The pledge helped me a good deal. I went without drink after I signed it, longer than I ever did before since I was ten years old. But I was tempted. And you folks who have never drunk in your lives don't know what it is to be tempted in that way. I broke my pledge. I tried to make the boys believe that I did it for fun and that I didn't care. But it wasn't so. I felt bad. I can't tell you anything about how bad I did feel, but I thought there is no use trying any more, and so I give up. But I had a friend and here Jim's voice broke a little, and that friend came after me and talked to me and coaxed me and wouldn't let me go to the dogs that time, though I seemed to want to bad enough. So I tried again, tried harder than I did before, and you'd be surprised at the lot of folks that wanted to ruin me, and how hard they worked for it, and how few there was seemed to care whether I was ruined or not. Well, the lot succeeded, and down I went again, and that time I was worse than before." but I had the same friend sticking to me and getting me to promise to try again, and though it seemed to me of no kind of use, I did try, some weeks at a time, and then I tumbled back again, and one night when my boss came and made an offer to go to another town to work, I jumped at the chance, for, says I to myself, I ain't nobody and I can't be. I've tried as hard as a fellow could, but I was too far gone before I begun." So now I'll go away, and I can spree it as much and as hard as I like, and there won't be anybody to feel bad or to coax me, nor to care what becomes of me. So I went away, and before I'd been gone one day, who do you think I found was after me harder than anybody had ever been before? Why, it was the Lord himself, and he didn't let go of me, though I tried to get away. I went into a rum hole, and he followed me and coaxed me out before I took a single drink. I told him it was no use says I, I've tried it again and again, and I ain't nobody, and I can't be. Now I've give up for the last time, and want to be let alone. And says he to me, Jim, that's just the trouble. You've tried it, but never have tried me, never. It is a good help, but you are too far gone. You want something stronger. You want something so strong that you can't get away from it. You want more than that. Something so strong that you can't want to get away from it. Try me, Jim, try me and it kind of flashed all over me that this was the solemn truth, and I just stood still there in the street in the dark, and says I, O oh Lord, I will, and I did. And all the while I was to work in that mill, and going up and down those streets, and passing hotels and saloons and cellars by the dozen, he never left me a single minute, not a minute. I didn't even want to go into one of them places. I shrunk away from them. I hated them. I worked against them all the time. I didn't feel afraid I should go back to them any more, for I could feel that the Lord had tight hold of me. And now I am his. Here Jim paused in his rapid, eager talk, and drew out his handkerchief, and wiped away the tears that had been rolling down his cheeks. And there seemed to be need for many handkerchiefs around the church just then. I've just one more thing to tell the boys, he began after a moment, and that is, 
if they really want to get away from the rum, or even if they don't want to and are willing to be coaxed into wanting to, he's the friend and helper to come to. The pledge is good, it helped me. I love it, and I'll work for it. But God is stronger than the pledge, and some of us need just the strongest kind of help that we can get. Oh, boys, come and try my friend. You don't know anything about him, and it's little I can tell you. But I can feel it, and so can you if you want to. Now I want everybody to know, and Jim drew himself up with strange dignity, and spoke in very solemn tones, I belong to the Lord, body and soul. I'm going to live for him and work for him. But there's something of a great deal more importance than all that. He's going to live for me. There was a solemn silence in the room for a moment after Jim took his seat. The boys from the mill were absolutely quiet and grave. They had been listening while one of their number spoke in an unknown tongue, and they marveled greatly. Mr. Nelson arose at last and stood for a moment in silence. Then his touched and tremulous voice broke the stillness. Our friend has proved to us forcibly tonight that his help is in God. He said, Some of us need just the strongest kind of help that we can get. I want to vary that statement a little, and express my solemn conviction that all of us need just that kind of help, and that is found alone in God. I honor the total abstinence pledge. I believe it to be one of God's chosen instruments of usefulness. I will work for it from this time with renewed energy and earnestness. But I have been slowly turning from my early bulwark that man needed but to use the strength inherent in his nature to be what he would. I feel that I need God, and I hereby pledge myself and all that I have and am and hope to be to his service from this time forth. Let us pray. I thought you would be happy tonight, Mr. Nelson said gently to Dell as they walked homeward, and here you are in tears. How is this? I am weeping over my own folly, Dell answered, smiling a little through her tears. Though I pride myself on being a daughter of the king, it seems I cannot trust him to do his own work in his own time and way, but seem determined to insist on choosing my time and my way, and when I fail, discouragement and depression seize upon me as if the cause were lost. End of chapter 21 Recording by Tricia G.